Welcome. Just waiting for all the attendees to enter the, the webinar. Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome at the digital book launch of Wasted When Trash Becomes Treasure. I'm Ruth, I'm an editor at Ludion, and we are the proud publisher of the book we are launching here tonight. First of all, I want to thank Matt for hosting us. Uh, it's a special place for us to present this book and talk about it because first of all, we are neighbors here in Brussels, but more importantly, Matt is also the home to Studio Plastique, a designer duo that is portrayed in the book, uh, among other 29 uh, wonderful designers with a fascinating project called Common Sands, um, Sand. Um, as they call it, it consists in a series of beautiful objects uh, such as plates and bowls made from glass, um, actually sand, silica, the main component of glass, that they retrieve from dumped um, household appliances such as microwaves, fridges, washing machines, um, all things that have a very short lifespan. And what is very clever is that they engrave in each object the origins and the life cycle of the glass it is made from. So you know exactly where the glass of this beautiful object if you hold it to your hands um, comes from and when it has been dumped and transformed into, into the object you hold in your hands. Um, I'm very honored to introduce our speakers today. And Katie Tregiden is a journalist, a writer and a speaker specializing in crafts and design with a strong focus on sustainability uh, and a circular approach to design. Uh, she's the author of the book we're launching here tonight and she will be talking from Cornwall, I think, where she's based. Uh, Glenn Adamson will be talking to us from New York, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he's an art historian, a writer and a curator. He is currently senior scholar at the Yale Center for British Art and has previously been uh, the director of the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. He has meant a lot for the valorization of crafts in the United States and um, his research focuses on that space where contemporary art, design and crafts meet. Uh, he has written the foreword to our book, Wasted. It's a true honor to have them both here tonight. Um, you should know that only the speakers will be connected uh, with their microphones. The rest of us will have our mics uh, muted and our cameras turned off. Uh, if you want to say something, if you have any questions, please ask, th ask them and put them in the Q&A uh, chat box whenever you want during the talk. Uh, Katie and Glenn will answer these um, or some of these at the end of the, the conversation. Uh, the talk will be recorded, will be published on the website of Matt. So if you want to watch it again or share it with friends, you'll have that possibility. Um, thanks to all for being here tonight. I will now give the floor to our two speakers. Please enjoy the talk. Thank you, Ruth, for that lovely introduction. Um, and I should say thank you, Glenn, for writing the forward because I don't think we've been in a room together since that. So, um, yeah, your books have meant a lot to me. So that was an incredible moment when you said yes uh, to that request. Um, we're here at Mad Brussels, virtually, of course, um, alongside Transitions, which is an exhibition that's been curated by Studio Plastique, all about moments of change, de decomposition, collapse, uh, dismantling, transformation, growth, progress. Um, and in the introduction to the book, one of the things I talk about is that waste is actually generated in, in just such a moment of transition. Um, so I argue that waste is not a, a fact, but a category. Um, and I don't use this example in the book because it's a little bit silly, but an example that really brought it to life for me was I was having beans on toast for my lunch. So I was sitting down, I was eating the beans, I was putting them in my mouth. Five minutes later, I finished my lunch and I'm scraping my plate into the bin and I got a bit of bean juice on my finger. And my reaction was to go, Ugh. <laughs> and I just thought it was fascinating how one minute this thing had been food and the next minute it was waste and it, it repulsed me. I very much wanted it away from me and, and off my body. Um, so I think there's a, an interesting connection between the exhibition that's on at MAD at the moment and the way I portray waste in the book. And I wondered if you might like to start by, by reflecting on that, that transition from valued object to waste. 
Sure. Uh, thanks, Katie. And it's uh, great to be here with you as well. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. And uh, great to be hosted by Mad uh, and Publisher. Um, so what can I say about that? Well, first of all, I totally buy your argument. So I'm going to give credit where credit is due here because I've really learned this from you in the book. Um, the idea that waste is not so much a category and particularly not a final category where something's ar arriving for good and staying there, i.e. underground in a landfill, but rather we should think of it as a phase in an overall process. Um, and so this is where the idea of a closed loop system of resource management or uh, a circular economy would be the other common way of putting this uh -huh. comes into play because what you see is that um, the the status of being waste is more like the status of it being nighttime, let's say. So something goes out of sight, uh, goes into the darkness, but then it reemerges again uh, into a new form. And one reason I use that, um, that kind of natural metaphor for describing what we're after here is that, of course, this is in fact how the world works if you're not a human, <laughs> because of course, nature is extremely good at producing uh, itself out of its own waste. And we're all familiar with this concept. Again, you know, compost in the garden, uh, leaf fall in the forest that generates new growth, the decay of bodies, uh, even, you know, the decay of whales that become skeletal cathedrals at the bottom of the sea and then become habitats for other animals. Um, you know, that is happening around us all the time. And one, one thing that I'm sure we'll get on to is that when you start thinking about the circular economy as a designer, often your thoughts will go towards biodesign or nature as a metaphor and methodology yeah. for um, thinking about human-based practice. Um, so that's, that's a sort of initial set of thinking that I might offer. Um, it's just maybe good to underline that uh, the pathway to preserving the environment actually involves specifically learning from the methodology that's already inherent in the environment, which is a kind of beautiful poetic fact, but also probably um, shows us that we're finally getting onto the right track. You know, um, if I could uh, ask you a question in return and what Katie and I decided to do, by the way, if, for those listening, is sort of interview each other <laughs> because we both get interviewed and we also interview other people and we thought let's just do both at the same time so um this is a like a true double hander um so one of the quotations that i picked up in my foreword from the book is from uh, dirk van der Koy, who says that making is inherently bad for the environment which is a, an incredible line um and of course if you're involved deeply in craft and design the prospect that the best thing you could do is persuade all of your friends and maybe yourself to just stop in your tracks and cease and desist. Um, but obviously this is being said by a designer. That's what Dirk van der Koy does for a living. So I thought I would put that to you. What do you think of that line making is inherently bad for the environment and how do you think your way around that um, possibly uh, incontrovertible claim? Yeah, I mean, I think the point you made in, in the forward is is valid, which is that we're not existing in a vacuum. You know, this is a, a world in which there is stuff and we need stuff currently. Um, but I think it certainly prompts thinking. You know, it's, it certainly makes you stop. As you say, if the best thing the industry in which you and I exist can do for the environment is just to stop, you know, then we've really got to think carefully before we do make something and put something into the world. Um, and it's something I thought really carefully about before making this book, because obviously Ruth and I between us have created an object which is now out in the world. Sure. Um, and we spent a long time sort of debating how we could make sure it lived up to the values espoused by the book. So the cover is made of something called Remake by Favini which is um, a sort of hardboard that's made of the residues of the leather manufacturing process. So the waste from that process combined with wood pulp um, and what looked like a plastic poly wrap cover that it came in, which you can imagine I got some abuse on social media about, um, is actually made from the waste process of sugar processing. So it's a polyethylene made from sugar ethanol. Um, and it's completely biodegradable. Um, I almost 
offered to eat some on Instagram to prove that it was safe, but luckily didn't go quite that far. Interestingly, though, the paper is not recycled. And I really, really wanted the paper to be still recycled. Ruth really, really wanted the paper to be recycled. But the only way we could have used recycled paper, because it's a lot more expensive than virgin paper, was to print in China. And the idea of shipping thousands of books from China to Europe and the States generated a carbon footprint that outweighed the benefits of using recycled paper. So we used FSC certified paper, which makes sure that the forests that it the paper comes from are maintained and the people involved in that production are protected but it wasn't ideal and I think what that told me as much as any of the designers I interviewed in the book told me was this stuff is complicated you know it's it's nuanced and it's layered and it's not as simple as just waving a magic wand and saying we should all use waste for everything um, and I think it shows just how far we've got to go before we can move to a more circular economy and as you say learn the lessons of of nature we're still very entwined in this kind of human created system um yeah you know i might just jump in there and say that a lot of what we're talking about here has to do with economies of scale uh -huh. and the thing as a as a craft specialist i think a lot about this um because craft is often positioned as an inherently ecological way of making and I think that appeals to our common sense very immediately and obviously. And, you know, it even is a bit of a stereotype, you know, the hippie pot, you know, made in a country um, ceramic studio, as opposed to the centrally manufactured slip cast, you know, spray glazed China that's coming from China. Um, but only a moment's reflection is sufficient to make you realize that actually the handmade pot from Vermont is much more carbon intensive and ecologically damaging than the Chinese plate because the Chinese plate is able to be made in a, a highly efficient manner mm -hmm. in a highly efficient factory these days. It wasn't always the case in China, but it certainly is now. Um, whereas the individual potter in Vermont is going to have to not only ship all the materials to that place to have them made but also there's probably going to have a very inefficient relatively small kiln and then there's going to need to have a distribution system for those pots one by one people are going to be driving to the pot to buy it off the cute table out front on the sunday you know third sunday in june all that right so once you once you look at the adjacencies around the made object you realize that what seems to you as being a sustainable strategy is often not and your mm -hmm. example there of actually using virgin paper because you were saving the um, shipping miles on the other side of the ledger. It's a great example of how these trade-offs have to be made and it just shows you that there's really, really no magic bullet and you have to actually subject the situation to a lot of analysis. And I guess, you know, one question I'm curious about, Katie, is whether you were able to kind of ultimately work out how legitimate the idea of using waste really is as an ecological prospect because it seems to me just intuitively that the task of taking miscellaneous materials from a dump or wherever they've been thrown and recovering them is actually very very energy intensive and i wonder whether you were left ultimately optimistic about this as a strategy in a sort of general sense yeah i mean i think there's two things that came out to me one is that most of the projects in the book are craft based they're mm -hmm. studio practices who have got the time and energy to do that and they're making relatively expensive objects on a relatively small scale um and there's an argument to be said that in order to solve really big problems we have to scale what i think is interesting about a lot of those projects is that having cracked the process a lot of them are then working with scientists engineers technologists manufacturers to scale it mm. so i think it's partly about the people whose waste streams those are being more transparent being more open to allow people to come in and understand the nuances and complexities of their waste streams i think there's a role for technology to play in sorting and identifying waste but i also think I sort of want to challenge the idea that we have to scale. Everything has to reach a global scale in order to be successful. I think there's also something to be said for localized production and consumption and the idea 
that actually rather than one of the designers in my book going global and solving all the problems, it might be more that hundreds and thousands of craftspeople can make a little difference and that can all add up. Mm. And I'm sure it will need to be a combination of both. Um, but yeah, I think I make no pretense that the projects in this book are going to solve climate change or single-handedly bring about a circular economy, but I think they are more than interesting, thought-provoking pieces. I think a lot of them have the potential mm. to scale or the potential to be replicated or the potential to inspire similar projects. So yeah, yeah it's certainly a complicated problem, but I think, I think there's hope in there. I think, you know, what it does for me anyway, um, and I wonder if you would agree with this, is that it actually reframes your critical assessments of these projects, because what you realize is that what you probably should be thinking about is not so much how memorable or aesthetically resolved they are, but how legitimate they are as research and development exercises. And I think here of um, a good example, though not in the book, is Christine Mendertsma, who is a Dutch designer who well, has done lots of interesting things, including tracking down every use of a single pig through many, many uh, different industries, all these kind of different applications of the materials that are extracted from that one pig body. But the project I, I was thinking about in this context is um, one in which she worked out a means to disaggregate effectively a pile of jumpers or sweaters, as we would say here in, in America. Um, so the idea here is that you have a very miscellaneous bunch of fibers that are sitting in this big smelly pile <laughs> and you have to come up with a way of sorting them and then directing them into different production streams, re-spinning them probably and then reweaving them. And she um, worked with uh, you know, actual real textile industry to try to develop a means of uh, figuring this out in a way that was actually cost effective. Mm -hmm. the, the exhibition itself is basically just a pile of sweaters and then a bunch of samples of wool compared to some of the other things that she's done. It's not particularly sculptural, mm. but it's um, maybe the most important thing that she's done in some ways, because if, if she could really crack that, as you say, and turn it into a real strategy, then yeah. you know, we'd, we'd be getting somewhere. So yeah. it, it I just think... makes you realize you have to be a bit more practical. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of the hard work is happening the... Behind the scenes in systems and processes in that way. There's a, an example in the book by a designer called Chiara Tomencioni Pisapia, um, who used moth larvae to break down keratin based fibres. So anything that comes from animal like cashmere, wool, silk can be digested by moth larvae. Mm. And she took their droppings and made these beautiful little brooches, which is lovely, but incredibly slow and on a tiny scale. But what she's doing now is working with scientists to extract the enzyme that actually digests those fibres to see if that can be scaled up and applied to, you know, a similar bunch of miscellaneous fibres. It would then digest the keratin based ones. And that would be a way of sort of processing the huge amounts of textiles waste that that we're yeah. generating. But a question I've got for you, all of this stuff is about lessening damage. It's kind of, it's ways to make the design industry do less harm or mm. undo some of the harm that's being done by the linear take make waste model. Do you think, or are you starting to see an obligation on behalf of designers and craftspeople to actively do good, to sort of you know, the third tenet of the circular economy is to regenerate natural systems. And I'm certainly seeing a lot in the design out waste and a lot in the keeping materials and objects in use, but less in that space of regenerating natural systems. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I mean, another uh, designer who springs to mind here for me would be Marlene Huiso, who mm. is known for her um, furniture made of, you know, insect-based bioresins, so sort of... Um, you know, sustainably non-harm harvested um, material that she's made into these. This actually is quite aesthetic and quite sculptural, but, um, you know, she's the daughter of a beekeeper. And so she's sort of taking that idea of a sustainable regenerative insect colony and thinking about it as a way of creating objects. But one of her more recent projects is um, creating furniture for insects. And the idea is that she makes these chairs that are basically public sculpture that sit in a park, or whatever, and they're designed in such a way as to become an ideal home for an insect colony. 
So that would be a really good, I don't know, emblematic version of what you're talking about. Yeah. You're probably right to say that a lot of the people who are doing good in this way, although I would consider them to be designers or maybe systems engineers, uh -huh. are working behind the scenes. And so they're not working in the kind of gallery based or museum based or indeed photographically based um, situation that I'm really myself following and, and know about. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a, maybe a point to make there as well, which um, I hope this isn't going to be too complicated, but it reminds me of what was happening in the 1950s in America and elsewhere to a lesser extent in what has now come to be called the designer craftsman. I would say craftsperson, but back in the 50s, designer craftsman model. Um, the idea being that the artisan would attach themselves to industry and serve as a kind of guarantor of humanistic values in the context of mass production. So this was an effort not to combat ecological change, of course, in the 1950s, that wasn't really on their mental map, but was an effort to combat more simply the dehumanizing effects of mass production and mm -hmm. sort of, you know, rising consumer culture. And I think there's something similar happening now where you have, as you're describing, designers and artists attaching themselves to scientific or engineering-based or production-based uh, organizations and sort of offering themselves partly as idea generators because of course artists think laterally in really amazing ways and sometimes they see things that people who are inside the system don't. But I actually think the more important thing, oddly, is that the artists serve as the kind of spokespeople or um, symbolic communicators of these efforts. So what mm. they're actually making may or may not have an R&D function, but what they can do is help persuade the public that these things are, are happening, first of all, and that they're valid and they're interesting and they're to be supported and ultimately financially supported because that's... Mm that's what it's going to take so um in a funny way the aesthetic skills of the artists come back into play as a kind of almost like a kind of branding in a weird way like an anti anti-branding form of branding because ultimately we're going to have to persuade the general public that their overall quality of life their standard of living as they have defi de defined it previously is going to have to decline if mm. there's, no problem. there's just no way around that and I think we'll need every tool in the box in order to achieve that. And art is going to have to be one of them, you know. Um, on that point, I wanted to ask you about another quotation that, again, I used in my foreword, which is from Helen Keller. Mm -hmm. so she said, um, I just, I mean, she's so incredibly quotable, but this is a good example. She said, the world is full of suffering. It is also full of the overcoming of it. So I wanted to ask you if you agree with that at the end of the day, having done this book? And also, where do you see this overcoming happening um, mm. in the projects that you covered in Wasted? Yeah, I love that quote. It was such a beautiful way to, to end a, a forward that started with the concept of the world being full and sort of thinking about what it was, it was full of. Um, I think we get to choose. I think it's up to us where we choose to place our attention mm. and where we choose to look. Um, I think you could you could see the world as full of. So, for example, I have a lot of conversations with people that say there's absolutely no point in us trying to solve climate change because we can't. You know, humans are just not going to pull together. They're not going to do it. We've only got five or ten years. We might as well just enjoy our <laughs> gas guzzling four by fours and our flights while we can and then buckle in for the ride when it all goes to hell. Oh. Um, and you know, maybe we can, maybe we can't, I don't know yet, but we certainly can't if we don't try. So my approach is to look for those overcomings and to share them. And I think there's a, a wonderful book I've read recently. I don't know if you've read this one, The Future We Choose. Mm -hmm. um, and they, it starts with two versions of 2030, one in which we've done nothing and one in which we've done everything. And then it sort of says, you get to choose. Um, and if you want to choose the version in which we've done everything and it's all fine, uh, you need three mindsets and then 10 practices. And one of the three mindsets is stubborn optimism. Mm. And I think that's something I really saw in all of the makers in the book. And that's something I see, I've been doing a lot of reading recently from 
uh, environmentalists and activists, particularly women and people of colour. Uh, there's another amazing book called All We Can Save, which is an anthology of female writers on, on climate change. And I think what you see is this sense of stubborn optimism. You know, this is an incredibly complex problem. Nobody's going to solve it on their own. Um, and it requires as you say, designers and craftspeople and artists to move away from that beautiful aesthetic thing that can sit in a gallery and everybody can coo over and start to work in, in things that are harder to communicate, harder to win plaudits for, harder to access the success of. Mm -hmm. And I think that requires stubborn optimism. And I think it's about choosing to see the overcoming of suffering and choosing to put your efforts and your money, you know, on that, um, and choosing to share those stories. Yeah, can I um, just bring in a comment from the chat, which is mm. a point. So Paula Nerlich just commented, I think the quality of life does not necessarily decline. There will be many elements supporting quality of life when moving towards circular systems. It might just be qualities we're not used to yet, such as blue skies, <laughs> so nice. Um, yeah, and that's that's uh, that's absolutely right. That's That's why I said, people have to get used to the quality of life as they have defined it or have they mm -hmm. understood it previously. That's what's going to have to decline, but it will be replaced by other qualities that they perhaps have not been as open to. Yeah. Uh, in, you know, the slow economy, of course, is sort of all built around this. But I think that's the context in which it's a narrower point, but one that's very important for our discipline. That's the context in which that redirection of attention away from the aesthetically resolved object and towards the conceptually resolved project needs to be understood and I think that's a crucial shift that's happening in design practice right now away yeah. from the aesthetically resolved object towards the conceptually resolved project um, yeah absolutely and I, I think to Paula's point I think that's something that started to happen during lockdown yeah. You know, usually I would have left this country many, many times in the course of a year and I haven't been any, I've barely left my county since February, yeah. but I've discovered all sorts of wonderful things on my doorstep. And I think it's, it's, it's part of the communication job, isn't it? If we're asking designers and craftspeople and artists to sell this to the public, you know, yeah. if we're asking them to, to communicate this complex change, part of that is a about this idea of degrowth and, and slow living and sort of tourism that involves looking really closely at places close to you rather than drifting past somewhere very far away at, at high speed. Right. Um, and I think there's definitely a storytelling role and also, as you say, a systems design role for creative people to play in that, in that shift. Yeah, um, there's another really good uh, comment in the, uh, chat, which is from, um, from Monique Bukoy, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, who says, um, listening to the speakers, I suggest changing the title of the book, too late, but I suggest <laughs> that maybe the title of the book should have been Enriched When Trash, Trash Becomes Functional, is waste not very 20th century, and that actually leads to a, a point that we were going to cover, which is the word waste, because maybe this is in line with what we were talking about earlier, with waste being a phase rather than being a permanent condition. A lot of the practitioners that you worked with, as I understand it, don't really even like the word waste and they don't use it. And I wonder what lay behind your choice of the word for the title beyond its catchiness and um, what, you know, how you regard that piece of vocabulary now. Yeah, I, I, I've never come up with one of my books before this one and I said, we've got to call it wasted. And she said, is this a British sense of humor thing? Yeah. <laughs> so for those who aren't familiar <laughs> with the twist, uh, waste as a way of describing being very drunk in British yeah. uh, sort of colloquial language um, which amused me um, but I also liked the fact that there was a wasted opportunity here so before the designers that we're talking about in the book came along waste is being wasted and I, I quite like that play on on words as well um, but I think you're right it's interesting that pretty much every designer I interviewed said we've got to stop calling it waste it's not waste, it's just, it's just another resource. And it's interesting how many of them came across the idea of using waste as a resource, not from an environmental perspective at all. So uh, some of them were students who didn't have enough money to buy raw materials and found other students wasting. Um, Charlotte Kidger makes things out of CNC dust. 
and her architecture buddies were making models from foam out of CNC and this stuff was just piling up in, in the workshops. And she was like, hang on a minute, yeah. I can have all this for free. Um, other people started using it because they were looking for a specific color. I think Charlotte Jocaneer wanted a specific shade of gray and could only find it from paper pulp from a local printer. So there's all sorts of different ways that people have come to waste and not always from an environmental point of view, which I think just makes the point that this is just a, a resource. Um, and it's interesting that when I started writing the column for Design Milk, which is around a similar theme, somebody sent me a very shirty email saying this isn't about the circular economy. There is no waste in a circular economy. Mm. And I sort of had to go away and think about it. And I thought, God, have I got this really wrong? And then I thought, yeah, OK, the first tenet of the circular economy is design out waste. So when we eventually get to a circular economy, there will be no waste. Yes. But for now, we're living with the legacy of 200 years of take, make, waste. <laughs> and we kind of need to do something with all that waste. And I think if it means we can keep materials and objects in use, then that's very much in line with the circular economy. But also if it means we don't have to take a virgin material out of the earth, that we can just use something that's currently ending up in landfill and causing pollution instead mm. then that's got to be a good thing but I think I don't think it's just semantics I think there is importance in you know you, you mentioned earlier the word craftsman and said you'd rather say craftspeople I had a conversation with someone who said oh but isn't it a bit of a mouthful and I was like yeah it is but either it's a bit of a mouth for me or an entire gender of craftspeople get left out. So I'd, I'd rather have the little bit of a mouthful. And, um, you know, we're seeing the same thing with gender non-binary pronouns right now, that they're a bit tricky grammatically. And one of the people in the book is gender non-binary and uses they, them pronouns. And grammatically, it's a little bit tricky. But I think these are shifts in grammar and shifts in word usage that are tiny in comparison to the positive effect they can have if we all get used to them. Um, well, so also the stumble is the point, right? The fact that you you have difficulty, like every time you have difficulty calling somebody who uses uh, they, the they them pronouns when you call them she, and then have to correct yourself, you realize that you kind of haven't made it somewhere where you need to be. Yeah. So the yeah, the obstacle, so called, is actually the goal. Yeah. It, in reverse. And I, I totally agree with you about the word waste, by the way. I think whether you think about it in the context of designing out waste, you obviously need the concept there. So if you're thinking about it as a kind of redefinition project, it makes sense to use it in that context. And it also, of course, makes sense because one person's waste is another person's, well, the idiom is treasure, right? But one person's waste is another person's raw material is what we're really talking about. And so there's also this sense of multi-perspectival yeah. conditions that we're trying to navigate here. So I think for all kinds of reasons, it's still a word that's absolutely in play from my point of view. Yeah, and there's actually an example in the book of, I think it's 11 companies in a city in Denmark who've created a, a circle and each one uses the waste of the person before as a valuable raw material, which is exactly that point, right? This person is handing over a thing that's useless to them. And the next person is saying, gosh, thank you, I needed that. Um, and so, you know, it's one man's trash is another man's treasure is the is the, the idiom. So I've got another a semantics question for you. Mm -hmm. um, you talked in an interview with Grant Gibson, I think it was a book club for Crafts Magazine, yeah. about the fact that uh, we tend to associate craft with women and people of colour uh, and art or industry with men and white people. Um, and you said something I found fascinating, which was perhaps it's not that women and people of colour practice craft, but perhaps it's that craft is what we call whatever they make and that craft is a, an ideological and a political and a loaded term that's de designed to diminish them. Right. Um, I'd love you just to say a little bit more about that for the sake of people who didn't listen to that interview and then maybe help me to understand what we can do about that, how we can unmarginalize craft and people who practice craft specifically in kind of service of helping to get them involved in the circular economy and, and addressing mm -hmm. climate change. Yeah, so th there's a lot to talk about there. Um, I guess, well, for one thing, I might just take the perhaps out and say that's just the way that I see it. So I feel like the you have to go back 
to the 18th century before craft is separated out mm -hmm. as a way of making things that's placed in contrast with industry. And you have to think of the things that get called craft as being essentially the domain of production of people who are not the owners of the means of production in an industrial context. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a mouthful. But all I mean here is that women, uh, non-European peoples generally, and then non-white people living within Europe, and also importantly, working class people, mm -hmm. uh, which you didn't mention, but it's part of the story, of course, um, the means that they are able to still control are the things that get defined as craft in the first place. Right. So rather than thinking of craft as the sort of, I don't know, marginal activity that's left to the um, marginalized people, you have to think of the very conceptual footings of the word and the concept as we use it today as being based in power asymmetry back mm -hmm. in the emergence of the industrial revolution. Um, so then if we, take that to the present day and ask, well, what do we do about that? Well, there's a couple of ways you could think about it. One is the method that I would associate with feminism, where you take the term and flip it upside down. So you just take the, the underprivileged term and you put it on top. It's pretty simple, but very effective. So you say, like the, the suffragettes did with the, absolutely. that was a sort of disparaging term, wasn't it, that was applied to them and they just took ownership of it and said, yeah, that's what we're going to call ourselves. Absolutely. Or, you know, the American use of the N word by black communities, same sure. thing. You take the term of abuse and you turn it into a term of empowerment. And of course, you see that all the time with craft where people are in a way accepting that this is the situation. And saying, okay, I'm going to take the the disempowered term and I'm going to run with it and show you how, just how powerful it is. It happens that the word craft is actually etymologically derived from the word power. Craft in German is with a K, it just means power. Um, so you have a lot to work with <laughs> if that's the approach you want to take. Um, but there's another thing you can do, which is to challenge the dichotomy. And that's more the deconstructivist approach, which of course also has a very uh, strong tradition within feminism and uh, post-colonial theory to do with uh, race and ethnicity and you know post-imperial politics and um, there the uh, move is to say well actually for example industry can't do without craft because if you don't have hand machine builders you don't have an industrial revolution if you don't have prototypes you don't have the iphone etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's showing that actually um, what you thought was a pretty simple situation of hand versus machine is actually a completely bound together, imbricated, complex situation of mutual dependency. So um, that's a lot <laughs> to think about. But when we come to the question how all that applies to the circular economy, I guess I would make a simpler point, which is that if you want to have a circular economy, everybody needs to be involved in it. And probably everyone needs to be involved in it in something like an egalitarian way, or at least needs to have some form of agency. So mm -hmm. they can't be involved only as subjects that are being operated on. They have to be involved as subjects who are actually having their will known and expressed. And I think right now, to be honest, what you're, what you're seeing, and I think you probably would agree that your book is an example of this, a lot of the more complex versions of this narrative are being evolved in the um, traditional centers of power, i.e. Europe and America, uh -huh. and the, what used to be called the third world, so Asia, Africa, Latin America, those are increasingly becoming literally the dumping grounds. And this is a matter of like exporting the waste uh, from the centers of power to the decentered areas. It's what Ulrich Beck beautifully described in his book, The Risk Society, where you take the risks that you're exposed to and you move those elsewhere. And yeah. sure people will be subjected to them. So uh, again, I'm making this a little bit of a long story, but the point is that inclusivity, if you think about it globally, has to do with making the, the circular economy not like a microeconomy that only exists in France or Europe or Europe and America, but actually a circular economy because otherwise it will have no effect. You're mm -hmm. just moving the problem elsewhere, but it's still on the planet, so it still affects us all, mm -hmm. right? Because that's how carbon works. So Finally, we actually have a practical reason to be truly inclusive on a global scale. And the question is whether humanity will be up to it, you know? Um, 
So let, let me kind of turn the question, the same question in a way back to you. And um, there's a kind of interesting like overlap between our rhetoric because I called the last chapter in my next book, which is about American craft history. The last chapter is called Can Craft Save America? Which is a phrase I got from a group of students at an MA program at Warren Wilson College um, who were asking themselves that question. And uh, I was interested to learn that your own, was it your thesis was called Can Craft Save the World? Well, it, was the, it was the informal question I set myself for my master's and then each of my essays and my thesis kind of fitted. You're not, you're not allowed to have catchy titles like that for... <laughs> <laughs> The actual titles were much more long and academic, but yeah, yeah, it was kind of the question I set myself to guide my studies. Yeah, they don't teach you about branding in uh, graduate school, and you immediately. Really <laughs> um, so I guess um, I mean there's a flat way of asking the question, but how do you think that's going? Like, do you see in your own practice and what you're observing, do you see craft as having that salvational or recuperative effect? Yeah, I mean, again, with stubborn optimism, um, I, I really do. And I think it's partly about those people that we've spoken about. So women, working classes, people of colour who are traditionally associated with craft and the, I, I guess, their worldviews as well as their hand skills. So I think there's a lot to be said about craft and it's inherently more circular approach and obviously that doesn't apply to all craft but I think craftspeople tend to be mono materialistic they tend to have a much better material literacy than industrial designers and again there are exceptions to all of these things um, but I think craft is more closely related to the circular economy um, but I also think the worldviews of the people who practice craft are often collaborative so in order to learn a craft skill it usually has to be taught hand to hand mm. it's very hard to learn from a book um, and so there's something collaborative at least in the acquisition of the skill if not necessarily the execution of the skill um, and I think there's also something collaborative in terms of the, the sort of process, you know, even if you're a potter at a wheel in your garage in the middle of nowhere, you're still getting involved with other people in order to acquire the clay, in order to learn that skill, in order to kind of sell that product. Um, so I think there are worldviews in terms of a sort of collaborative approach and a connection to natural systems, which are valuable and which people could learn a lot from. And I think I think that's why I'm interested in this idea of how do we unmarginalize the people with those worldviews and the people with those craft skills. I mean, the government have announced that they're taking an all male delegation to COP26 next year, our government. So there will not be a single woman. Um, Bloomsburg convened an invitation only dinner on climate change they only invited one black person you know it sort of routinely the people you know there was um, an interesting I listened to a guy from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation speak um, recently and he said they did their first conference in New Zealand and they had a lot of indigenous people from New Zealand at the conference who were just looking at them with absolute bemusement as to why they would listen to people from the country who invented the industrial revolution, teaching them how to, you know, be more circular. And I think somehow we've got to switch the, the dial and start hearing from these marginalized communities, whether those are craftspeople, women, people of color, indigenous people, um, you know, indigenous people are trying really hard to protect their territories, which have, mm. I can't remember the statistic, but most of the world's rainforests um and they've got sort of ancestral knowledge about how to do that that you know sort of big european corporations who want to cut down the trees are just not listening to so i'm interested in how we kind of flip that yeah i mean that's a very thought-provoking um line of argument um I'm just looking at another question that's popped up in the chat, which is super relevant to this, which is from Isabel, who says, you say take mace, make waste is 200 years old. So how was it before that? And is waste production a new thing? And I guess my answer to that would be that, of course, what happened two years, 200 years ago is that we began extracting resources from the planet and processing them in ways that the planet couldn't readily 
reprocess. So, you know, if you had gone to a 17th century city anywhere in Europe, your first reaction would have been that it was disgusting because there would have been human waste flowing through every street. And you would have, I mean, the smell would have been to any modern person. Um, and of course, there are lots of parts of the world where there isn't effective sewage, where you can still go and experience this. But this was absolutely true everywhere in Europe. And so for somebody from now to be somehow time traveled back then, I would imagine your first thought would be, this is not just filthy and unsanitary, but dangerous. And it mm. was. People were dying of cholera and everything, the rest of it, right? But that was a kind of waste that the ground could absorb mm. and process, no problem. Whereas plastic, which seems to us to be so clean, mm. can't be absorbed. So that's why take make, make waste is effectively a problem to do with modernity. Because yeah, is- to make things in a way they couldn't be, you know, environmentally accommodated in that way. Yeah. There's another catchy three word phrase that sort of sums up what happens in the make bit, which is heat, beat, treat. Yeah. And I think, you know, it used to be that things were taken out of the earth and kept relatively recognizably animal, mineral or vegetable, and therefore they could be put back into the earth. Whereas now the way that we process materials, the way that we combine materials, I mean, one of the reasons trainers can't be recycled is because they've got so many different materials all combined in a way that can't be taken apart again. Um, and so another example in the book is Simone Post, who grinds up trainers and then smushes them into uh, sort of really hard wearing mats for Adidas, ironically enough. Mm. Um, but I think that's a lot of the problem. There was waste, but it was part of nature's circular systems. Nature actually, again, didn't see that as waste, saw that as nutrients and, and kind of compost and yeah. the process for, for that to begin again. And I think that's the, the problem that the Industrial Revolution has caused us. But, you know, just to get back to your point about indigenous forms of knowledge, um, I mean, just to be devil's advocate a, a little bit, it's sort of like what I was saying about the potter in Vermont. Mm. As sympathetic as I'm sure we all are to that idea that, you know, for example, the people who actually live in the Amazonian rainforest are the best stewards of it because they've been there for hundreds of years and they understand from long accumulated um, what is effectively research how to live in that environment and keep it um, in a sustainable condition. But I guess I'm a little suspicious of any argument that, that is sort of along the lines of let's stuff that genie back in the bottle mm. because I don't actually think, and I'm sure that members of most indigenous communities would agree that an indigenous community can really tell you how to cope with the disaster that's been caused outside of their own realm of activity. Mm-hmm. And of course, those disasters are very much being visited upon those communities. So I also think that despite what you're saying about the Maori, I take it they were Maori, the respondents at that conference in New Zealand, I think in a way, the authors of the Industrial Revolution, the catastrophes that it has caused, have not just an opportunity, but a a responsibility to do the larger part of the thinking here and to fix Mm -hmm. the problem, because we're the ones that have benefited from it, even if we didn't invent it. You know, mm-hmm. so do you think there's an analogy with the idea of craftspeople not having the solutions but being part of a collaboration with the people producing the waste and engineers and scientists? Do you think there's a, a sort of collaborative solution here? Yeah, again, I mean, that kind of goes back to our conversation about rhetoric earlier. I, I think it's very easy to assume that a craftsperson has a lot to tell a scientist until you go along and talk to a scientist. And then you're like, oh, I don't know anything about this. <laughs> right. So, so I, I'm, I'm always, I think in general, I'll just say that our, our period in history, one of the most important things that's happened and most destructive things that's happened is an overall lack of faith and expertise. Mm. And I can easily understand why that is because experts are the ones who got us into the predicament that we're in, right? So if you think of experts, expertise is mainly having been housed within the military industrial complex and then you look around at the world you're like well fuck experts pardon my french (laughs) right but you know i think having and of course that's how you get donald trump right Mm. he's like well nobody knows anything except me and i'm going to tell you how it really is in a language that a third grader can understand and a lot of people bought that line right so it's not so much a as i often say it's not so much a right versus left political conflict it's more like uh 
conflict between people who appreciate and understand complexity and people who fear it and refuse it. Right? Mm. And so that latter huge group of the population have come to be so inherently suspicious of expertise that they tend to just ignore it. And I think that there's a kind of left-wing creeping version of that where any form of expertise that exists inside that military industrial complex is going to seem suspicious and surely we in the arts will know a better way. Mm -hmm. I I, I tend to be very, very skeptical and hesitant about making that kind of an assumption for what it's worth. So despite that. I think that's a really interesting distinction because expertise tends to be what we call sort of Eurocentric academic knowledge versus sort of indigenous ancestral knowledge. But actually, I think the distinction between those who are comfortable with complexity and those who are frightened of it is a really powerful one. Yeah. And I think that is possibly one of the keys to unlocking all of this, because this is a hugely complex problem and it's going to require hugely complex solutions. Mm. And so it requires people who are comfortable with complexity, but I think it also requires people who can translate that complexity for those who are not comfortable with complexity. Yeah. And perhaps that are, that's the role of artists and designers and, and craftspeople in storytelling and taking that behind the scenes technological scientific innovation and making it into something that's beautiful and simple yeah. and aesthetic. And perhaps that sort of translation is part of this solution. Yeah, and it's also a role for generalists because you know, usually expertise and specialism go together. And that's uh-huh. true of the expertise that exists in, let's say, an Amazonian indigenous group. They have extreme expertise in living in that place. Yeah. A form of specialism, essentially, the same way that a nuclear physicist has extreme expertise in a cooling system in that one style of nuclear power plant. And they spend their whole life caring for that, right? So it's expertise in both cases, specialism in both cases, the contexts are different. But there has to be a role for generalists who can kind of do the connective tissue as mm. well. And again, that's something artists can be very, very, very good at. Mm. Hey, um, Katie, we have a really long comment question <laughs> I was in, the, to read it. <laughs> in the chat. Do we both want to look at it and yeah. process? Give us a sec, guys. We're going to read the very long question. <laughs> I'm not going to read it aloud, but let's read it. Okay, so the the actual question part of it is, it's actually sort of like what you were saying earlier about, you know, let's just dance on the edge of the grave because we can't do anything about climate change as individuals anyway. So it's kind of an economies of scale question. Uh But then this this idea of replacing GDP with an indicator that measures wellness and Mm. environment and society as has been done in New Zealand, allows mitigation strategies to be assessed more comprehensively. Is that something you've looked into? I think I haven't, so. Yeah, I mean, I think it touches on something you said earlier about, um, you know, exporting the waste. And there's this idea about, there's an idea, one of the other things this question mentions is the sort of idea of neoliberalism and and letting the market dictate Mm -hmm. what happens. And there's this idea that the market is a, a sort of closed, perfect system, and it's not. You know, there have always been externalities to the market, and those have been controlled with taxes and subsidies. And so it's a myth to believe that the market is this kind of independent force of humans that can just take care of things. Um, You know, an example is that pollution is an example of an externality from a a sort of market setup. Um, And we export a lot of our waste to developing nations. Um, Fossil fuel power plants are also disproportionately located in black neighborhoods in America. So the pollution and causes of asthma and you know, complications with coronavirus and all those sorts of things. Equally, we've decided that the arts are important. So we subsidize the arts and we make sure that we've got museums and galleries that might not be able to survive in a pure market system. And so I think, uh, yes, replacing GDP with an indicator that includes all these other things is really important. But I also think it's really important for politicians and people in positions of power to take responsibility for this fact 
and to use taxes and subsidies to help move us towards a circular economy. You know, at the moment, fossil fuels are cheaper than renewable energy. That doesn't have to be the case. We can change the taxes and subsidies in order to make renewable energy cheaper. And I think for a lot of people, for people who are less invested in the complexity of these issues, they will choose the energy tariff that's the cheapest. So if we make that the renewable one, and in fact, recently, that's become the the renewable tariff in my area has recently become the cheapest one and so all of a sudden everybody I know has switched to renewable energy for no reason other than the fact it's saving them a couple of bucks um so I think yeah that's we could probably talk for a long time to answer the complexities of that question but I think we definitely need to move to a system where we're not just measuring profits yeah um, so this is something in which I would declare absolutely no expertise whatsoever, but I, I guess I would just make a super simple point, which is that it's not necessarily obvious to me that uh, the solutions to this predicament will not be market-based, which I think is kind of what you're saying. You're just saying we need to weight the market differently. But I think as far as I can tell, it seems more plausible that we will find a solution within what um, Alessandra, I think it is, right? Uh, Alessandra is calling neoliberalism. I think it's more likely that we would find a solution within what we would all still recognize as neoliberalism, whatever that means, I know it's a complicated word, um, than that neoliberalism itself will somehow fall apart and will magically find some way to sure. reduce it as a world economy. So yeah. I, I, my, my instinct is to think we just need to game the market so that it'll become more profitable to be sustainable than to be unsustainable. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, there is also, well, you know, there is also an increasing move towards triple bottom line businesses who are measuring people, profit and planet. And there's a lot of research to say that consumers are actively pursuing those businesses. So B Corps and kind of other uh, businesses that have some measure to say, actually, we're making more ethical decisions are becoming more profitable as a result of not solely pursuing profit, which feels a little bit counterintuitive, but I think that's starting to happen. Yeah. I'm conscious we've only got another two minutes. Yeah. Um, and I have one more question for you. Well, should we try to tackle Lauren Chang's question? Oh, we should. Yeah, one, yeah. Um, maybe it's like the question you were gonna ask me anyway, who knows? <laughs> it's another so, long one, guys, so give uh, us a second. <laughs> um, I mean, I had a quick look at it and it looks like the sort of takeaway from it is that, um, and she importantly is asking this question from the position of being an, Amer an Asian American maker. So she's coming from that subject position that we've been- Lauren was actually one of the makers in my previous book. Oh, in great, okay, so. awesome, okay. So right at the end, she says, um, working from that place, blend of non-Western and Western upbringing experience, working from that hybrid place, we might call it, I don't know if that's the right word, but that that place requires being able to hold multiple complex and sometimes conflicting narratives simultaneously. Uh -huh. How does craft help us move away from the scarcity mindset to a place of abundance? And I like the way she's putting that because it's like a place of conceptual abundance, which is maybe like, you know, thinking the blue sky is abundant enough and that is your standard of living. Yeah. Which is utopian, but I think there's something there to hold on to here at the end. Yeah, and I, I think that that scarcity to abundance mentality is really important in, in all of this stuff, mm -hmm. um, in a move towards the circular economy, um, in the idea of the use of waste. So one of the things I explore in the book is we're running out of natural materials that feels scarce and frightening, but actually we've got everything we need in the stuff we've already taken out of the earth. So there's more copper in the ash that's left over after we incinerate waste now than there is in traditionally mined copper ore. So we've got what we need, it's already out of the earth, we've just got to find ways of, of getting at it. And I think that's one way of looking at that abundance mentality. I also think one of the mindsets in this book was about an abundance mentality. Um, and I think, I think that's really important. And I think it's really important just in terms of some of the things we've been talking about in terms of sort of common humanity the expression when you've got what you need, build a bigger table, not a higher wall, you know, is an idea of an abundance mentality. We haven't got to sort of pull out the drawbridge and, and protect what we've got from other people. We can share it in the knowledge that more will come. Yeah, awesome. Okay, should we let Ruth uh, take us out? Yes, let's. <laughs>
Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thanks so much for this talk. I have the feeling that you could have talked and you can talk about this for many more hours. Um, well, the least we could say is that we're in front of a very complex problem. Um, and uh, yes, uh, I have personally, as a philologist, I love the fact that the conversation has led us to rhetorics and semantics and about the fact that um, craft is actually loaded and a political term. Um, and maybe waste, the term waste um, is too. Um, I'm aware, such as one as one of the attendees uh, pointed out, that this book and the designers in it do not have the power to really weigh on uh, environmental policy and to create a circular circular economy on a global scale. But what I do think is valuable is that to a general audience and to me, a non-specialized audience, um, they show that thinking outside the box can be very easy and that. Um, it's, it's um, not that hard to rethink the way you live and the way you lay to waste. So that's maybe a bit naive, but uh, it's a positive thing. And it uh, brings us, I think, to closer to a, a better future, circle economy, even if it's on a very small local scale. Um, but thank you very much for your, for your time, for your talk. It was uh, fascinating. And thanks to all the attendees for uh, being here tonight. Um, I hope you have enjoyed it and enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Bye bye. bye. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. bye, -bye.